So I guess this, everyone here is a sucker for punishment having come to a, a, a science uh, talk on a Sunday morning. And I think a lot of people uh, kind of hope at least that sort of they don't have to deal with science after a GCSE or something. So um, I think, uh, yeah, a lot of people, if I tell them that really, if you're going to be a revolutionary Marxist, you have to take an interest in science, you have to take an interest in philosophy. A lot of people would probably want to walk out and uh, never, never have to think about those horrors of their school days again. But um, no, I think that the, the significance why we say that you should have uh, an interest in philosophy, why you should have an interest in science, is because uh, Marxism at its root is really a philosophy of change. It's a philosophy of development, of uh, a society of nature and of human thinking. And uh, um, yeah, this finds its, uh, its, its, itself uh, confirmed best, in my opinion, throughout the natural world and in the developments of, of the natural sciences as well. And uh, if, indeed, you might not think you have a philosophy, but you do have a philosophy. Uh, it is your worldview, and you can, you can bet your bottom dollar that the ruling class have their philosophy. They have their philosophy of change. For the ruling class, uh, if you think about it, change for them is, uh, is whatever maintains the status quo. You know, we, we have to sort of uh, understand that this system is the most natural system, and you know, the, the law of the jungle of the market is merely the translation into human affairs of the law of the jungle of nature, and this is the most natural system. And any attempt to change it, any attempt to shoehorn us into some more altruistic or socialistic uh, form of society always is unnatural, leads to totalitarianism and everything else. And as far as possible, I mean, these people sound ridiculous, but pre-2008, you have people like Gordon Brown, uh, saying that he, Chancellor of the Exchequer, elected in 1997, had done what no one had done in 300 years of, of, of capitalist history. He had put an end to boom and bust. Uh, obviously, these people look ridiculous now. Francis Fukuyama, who in a similar period was talking about the end of history. That, in other words, the system tends towards equilibrium. It expels its contradictions. Nowadays, we look, we look at these people and we think they're utterly ridiculous. But, of course, it, re it reflects the mentality of the ruling class who want to argue basically that the status quo is the only possible uh, uh, mode of existence and therefore give up. That's their, their, ch their philosophy of change can be summed up in two words. Give up in any notion of changing the world. This is the most natural system. And if change does take place, it takes place in a slow, evolutionary, gradualistic way, basically. Um, and uh, therefore, you know, don't think about revolution. Uh, uh, Marx, uh, Marx and Engels had a, a whole industry dedicated to disproving their ideas, but Lenin and Trotsky were the devil. You know, these people, these revolutionaries, these uh, were tried to impose upon us an unnatural system. Um, and uh, therefore, we need our own philosophy. The working class needs its own philosophy, because fundamentally, I think that if the working class cannot conquer its own worldview, cannot understand its own relationship to the world independently of the worldview of the ruling class, how is it going to conquer power? How is it going to transform society? So for us, and for the most advanced layers of the working class, it's necessary, uh, if we want to transform society, that we first of all conquer our own understanding of society, our own understanding of our relationship to society and nature, our own philosophy of change. And Marx and Engels took a lot of interest in uh, the natural sciences, and they took a lot of interest in, in, in philosophy as well, of course. Marx himself was a student of philosophy before he was a communist. Uh, and uh, they... Uh, um, yeah, they took a lot of interest in, uh, in, in philosophy. I, I apologize to uh, any students of philosophy in the audience today because uh, philosophy as it is today is, is basically, uh, it, it, is a, it is a complete swamp. It's a complete desert compared to philosophy as it existed in Marx's youth in Germany. And it reflects the fact that the ruling class nowadays uh, is completely and utterly, uh, they've lost confidence in themselves. They've lost confidence in their system. And therefore, the dominant philosophy in university departments, the reflection of this in the minds of academics, is that basically uh, we cannot understand history. History is irrational. Uh, this is the postmodern philosophy that, that, that we all have our own narrative, but understanding objective laws which govern uh, the development of society is, is a complete impossibility. And therefore, the idea of progress in particular is completely uh, out of the question. Uh, and this is, uh, this is really a reflection of the pessimism of the ruling class in, in academia. Now, in, in Marx's youth, uh, philosophy uh, uh, was very different. And this was a reflection of the fact that capitalism as a system was very different. It was still a revolutionary system. Uh, it was revolutionizing not just industry, science, and technique, but um, you had uh, great events like the, the, the French Revolution, which gave a huge impetus to human thinking. Uh, 
Uh, and and the, the, the capitalist class were fighting a struggle against all of the rubbish that had basically come down from the Middle Ages, against feudalism, against absolutism, uh, against mysticism and the Catholic Church. For, you know, philosophy and science were themselves battlegrounds in the, in the class struggle. And uh, therefore, uh, you had giants of philosophy in this period, quite unlike today. And one of the greatest philosophers of the, uh, of the modern age, really, um, a product of this period, was a guy called... Uh, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, uh, of whom uh, um, Marx in his youth was an avid uh, follower of his ideas. And uh, he made a, uh, I, I hesitate to say a discovery, he, he uh, rescued really a very ancient idea, uh, an idea which uh, owes its origins to the, there are elements of it in, uh, in, in ancient Eastern uh, religions and philosophies, uh, and it finds a very developed form in ancient Greek philosophy, so it was not a new idea. And, um, this idea uh, we refer to as dialectics, basically. Um, now, what is dialectics? Uh, dialectics, uh, Engels explains, represents the general law of development of nature, society, and thought. That's a, pretty, <laughs> that's a pretty bold claim, the idea that there is some general law of development of all of the, of basically the whole of matter uh, uh, and the whole of this material world. Um, so, uh, like all sciences, philosophy has its specialist language, but I think like all genuinely profound ideas, dialectics is not really a, com a very complicated idea. It can be very simply expressed, and I think it can best be expressed through examples, through, uh, through um, looking at how it, it we, we need to discover it in nature, in society, rather than, so, it's not something we can simply impose upon the world around us. It is a product of the world around us, and therefore it needs to be discovered and explained through the phenomena of nature and of social development. So let's have a bit of a look. What is this dialectics thing? So um, if I were to sum it up, um, I would probably use the aphorism of uh, an ancient Greek philosopher, a guy called Heraclitus, who uh, to uh, later philosophers was known as Heraclitus the Dark because he wrote in riddles and, and aphorisms and this sort of thing. And uh, he said the following, which I think sums up dialectics very nicely. He says that everything both is and is not, for everything is in flux. Uh, everything uh, is in a constant process of change. I both do and do not step in the same river twice. Now, this is an interesting uh, idea that con completely contradicts uh, our notion of common, common sense, right? Uh, how can everything both be and not be? You know, I am me. My name is Ben. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm not not Ben as far as I know. Um, this is a phone. It's not not a phone. Uh, it contradicts common sense. I'll come back to this question of common sense in a minute. Um, but let's look at this question in a little more detail. Am I really me? Well, if I go down to the level of my cells in my body, we'll see that they're constantly excreting matter into my bloodstream, uh, which has been removed through my kidneys and other organs, and I'm constantly ingesting food, which is, re, uh, you know, that is, is being reabsorbed into my cells from the bloodstream, these new nutrients. So that over the course of months or maybe years, I don't know exactly the time frame, every single molecule in my body will have been replaced by new molecules. And then if I ask you in a few months or years, am I still the same person? There is no simple answer. The answer is both yes and no. I'm both am and I'm not the same person at the same time. Excuse me. <laughs> um, it, it is a contradiction. And it is a contradiction. The logic you are taught in schools, formal logic basically, so-called common sense logic, cannot deal with. Everything in formal logic either is or it is not. And there is this law of the excluded middle. Um, Dialectics, on the contrary, is a philosophy of change. It is a philosophy of things in their motion. And in their motion, things have contradictions. Contradictions are not absurdities. Contradictions are very real. They exist in this material world. Motion itself is an expression of contradiction, that something can be and not be in the same place at the same time. And so, um, yeah, the, the, our common sense ideas break down when we take into, into consideration motion. That's not to say formal logic doesn't have its, uh, its area of applicability, but certainly uh, uh, things start to break down. These, these, these fixed categories cease to be fixed. They become blurry and things turn into their opposites. And we see this uh, in biology in particular. I took, took myself as, a, as, a, as an organism. Uh, the, the, we see that within biology, common sense has told people for thousands of years that things fall into s fixed static categories. Something is either a dog or a cat or a lizard or a plant or an animal. But uh, of course, the, the Greeks, who had a very profound grasp of dialectics, did understand that actually within biology, there, species can change. The idea of uh, Anaximander had, his, uh, had, a, had, a, had a theory of evolution, and, uh, but it was only in the past 150 years that you really had this put on a scientific basis with the theory of 
of, of evolution through natural selection, that things are not so fixed. Let's look at some examples. I mean, the most fundamental division within the sphere of organic life is probably that between plants and animals. And yet, if you go into the ocean, the majority of biomass in the ocean is composed of tiny uh, microscopic organisms called plankton. And many of these plankton, they move around and interact with their surroundings like animals, yet they have chloroplasts and photosynthesize like plants. They don't fit into any of these static categories, right? And this, uh, you can discover these, this, examples of this throughout nature. Viruses have none of the processes of metabolism like the rest of living, uh, you know, life as we know it. Uh, and yet they are able to reproduce much like life. They defy the categorization even into the categories of organic and inorganic life. And uh, the history of our, of, of, of our own species and how we conceive of the, d the development of our species uh, likewise has defined this simple categorization. Uh, it used to be that there was a very simple linear notion of how human life evolved, that we had these ape-like creatures that developed into upright apes, the Australopithecines, um, and that the, this, these then led to the emergence of hominids, uh, our more human-like ancestors, and finally Homo sapiens, sort of the crowning glory upon that. But in actual fact, more discoveries have shown that there is no clear distinction. The, 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 the discovery of new fossils, the um, advance of paleontology has shown there's all sorts of uh, uh, um, specimens that fit into neither the Australopithecines nor the hominids. And in fact, far from being this linear progress, what we have is all sorts of offshoots, evolutionary dead ends, remergers. We have the, the, the interbreeding in Europe of, uh, of, of Neanderthals with uh, Homo sapiens to a certain extent. So this, this simple linear image of progressive development broke, has broken down under examination. And in fact, if we look at the, the, the difference, evolutionarily speaking, between us and our nearest uh, uh, living relatives, uh, like the higher apes, we see that amongst uh, the, the higher apes, there is a, only a very small genetic difference, actually. The difference is as little as 1.2% uh, uh, difference in our genes and those of bonobo apes, for example, um, which is a tiny difference. To give you a sense of proportion, uh, the difference between me and any of you in this room, uh, genetically speaking, could be as great as 0.1%, which means that the leap from between us is only one twelfth of the difference of the leap between me and, a, and, a, and an ape. So it's a very small difference, actually, genetically speaking. And yet within this tiny quantitative difference represents such a tremendous leap that we are separated by an enormous gulf from the rest of the animal kingdom. We really, in many respects, are not animals uh, like the rest of the animals, which are unthinking, unconscious beings that only are able to project themselves a very limited amount into the future. We have wrought uh, changes upon the natural world, which uh, the only point of comparison can be like the, the evolution of... Uh, of multicellular life 550 million years ago. Such is the scale of this revolution contained within this tiny amount of, uh, of, of genetic difference. And this is precisely how dialectics explains that change takes place, not through gradualistic, slow, uh, progressive development, but actually these small quantitative changes reach a tipping point, and then you have huge qualitative transformations, revolutions, catastrophes, upheavals, as we're discussing today. Could I have some more water? And indeed, uh, Darwin's discovery, the, the, the process of evolution through natural selection, is really the discovery of dialectics, this, this law of quantity transforming into quality, um, as applied to the biological world. After all, the differences between organisms within a species can be measured quantitatively in their genetics, in the, in the, in the, in the lengths of their claws or fins or, or limbs and so forth. And yet, these small quantitative differences accumulate to make complete qualitative transformations, the emergence of new species. It is dialectics confirmed within nature. And yet Darwin's conception of this reflected the prejudices around him, the gradualist, reformist uh, prejudices, basically. He saw evolution as taking place not through these qualitative leaps, these revolutions, but in a slow, gradualistic manner, much in the same way that, for example, the, the, the branches slowly emerge uh, smoothly from the, the, the root of a tree, uh, the, the, the trunk of a tree. And, uh, uh, this, is not what the, uh, this is not actually what the fossil record shows us. We actually see that there are uh, periods when uh, species look completely the same. You go millions of years, ammonites look exactly the same, and then suddenly an adaptation or, or a speciation, they change, or they go extinct. And not just one species, but you have mass extinctions, huge upheavals. Undoubtedly, there was change taking place, small changes within their ecosystem, within their, uh, um, uh, within their genetics, uh, within their variation, within their uh, genes of that species, the gene pool of that species. And yet this slow, gradual, progressive development of, 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 uh, uh, of, of gradual change 
quasi-equilibrium basically exists. Is, this is then punctuated by tremendous revolutions. This was a great discovery in evolutionary biology, uh, which owes itself to two scientists in particular, Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Elridge. And in fact, um, there was one piece of evidence that Darwin put forward, uh, such was his sort of attachment to this slow gradualistic evolutionary theory of change, that, uh, that he thought it was a legitimate counter-argument to his entire theory, basically. And that was, if you go back 600 million years, there is only really one type of fossil that we see in abundance, and it's called a stromatolite. It is basically a, a big blob, which is formed when uh, single-celled algae basically form mats, essentially. Uh, that's all that existed, these single-celled organisms forming these big blobs, basically, all over the planet. Um, and then 550 million years ago, you see a sudden expl explosion, basically, of, of a huge variety of complex multicellular life forms. And uh, some of them have names like hallucinogenia, because they're so unlike anything you've ever seen, they are like from another world. Um, <clears throat> a fantastic array, a, array of new species evolving in what is a blink of an eye, geologically speaking. And Darwin could not explain this. Uh, now we see that there, is, that there, are, there are breakthroughs, and uh, Stephen Jay Gould puts forward the, the, the theory, that what actually happened is that you had one of these tiny little algae sat in one of these stromatolites, basically, um, start, where underwent a very small genetic change. It wouldn't have looked very different from the algae around it. And yet it started doing something remarkable. It started gobbling up all of the algae around it. And this was like a whip, basically, at the back of these, uh, these prey algae that were trying to escape from it that forced them to evolve mechanisms to get away from this out-of-control grazing algae, basically. And it, in turn, underwent uh, uh, evolution to try and overcome these. It, it was basically a giant arms race began 550 million years ago. And uh, it hasn't stopped accelerating since. A huge variety of species emerged from that difference that you would not have been able to tell the difference between these two microscopic organisms. Uh, and so you see that evolution really takes place in this manner of a punctuated equilibrium. Equilibria uh, punctuated by these tremendous revolutions. And this theory can be applied actually. Punctuated equilibria is a, is a phenomena of the whole of nature around us in many respects. It isn't just something that can be looked at in biology. Uh, and yet, when Darwin was writing, I talked about him discovering dialectics in evolutionary biology, physics, which was a far more advanced science in many respects, it had a, achieved a far greater level of, of completion. It had, it had even ossified into a complete worldview, completely rejected what we would understand as, as dialectics. The worldview which had de uh, developed uh, in the, in the mid-19th century was fundamentally the same as that developed by Newton in 1687 in his Principia. And his, according to this view of the world, the universe was governed essentially by simple, time-reversible, mechanistic laws, which can be calculated to a high degree of precision. And everything could be understood in these laws. Our, we also could be understood. Our hearts are merely pumps. Our arms are like levers. These are simple, mechanistic, Newtonian laws. And uh, this was developed to such a high degree, it became so ossified that a guy called Laplace put forward the idea that, imagine if we had this, this hyper-intelligence, people derogatory... Uh, Derogatory, derog yeah, no, derogatorily uh, referred, to, <laughs> um, referred to this as Laplace's demon uh, uh, subsequently. He imagined if you had an intelligence which knew the positions and momentum of every single particle and part of the universe around us, we could basically uh, um, uh, predict how the entire universe would evolve for, whole for all of eternity. And furthermore, we could even reverse the clock to say what the starting conditions of the universe were. In other words, this view of the universe um, completely expelled the notion of accident from physics. Everything was a matter of iron necessity. And if we see things that we don't understand, it's simply because there are gaps in our knowledge of the precise positions of everything in the universe. Um, so it completely expelled the notion of accident. Everything became a matter of necessity, if you like, within nature. Now, some, particularly within the idealist school of philosophy, rejected this view because they said, actually, whilst we have these laws of nature, nothing actually conforms to it. You, Galileo talks about how two things drop from the, the leaning tower of Pisa will hit the ground at the same time. They don't because of air resistance and everything else. Um, and therefore, he said, actually, everything in nature is subject to contingency, to accident and so forth. Uh, if there are laws within nature, they are unknowable because we cannot know the thing in itself. The laws we have are the product of are a priori uh, uh, products of a priori understanding, and we use reason and so forth to basically um, bring order to chaos. So the world is governed by accident. So the idealist took the opposite position, expelling necessity from the real world. Um, Hegel, his great revolutionary breakthrough, I think, in many respects, 
was he saw that, that accident and necessity, although contradicting each other, exist and depend upon each other. They condition each other. He said that he made the following very profound statement, that necessity expresses itself through accident. Now, this is a very interesting idea, in my opinion, and we've just looked at an example of that idea. Darwinian evolution is precisely an example. Because what, once one individual within a species, right, it can, be, it can be the fittest it likes, you know, it can be very well adapted to its surroundings. Uh, and yet, um, a forest fire can kill it off anyway. It can entirely accidentally fall into the, the jaws of a predator. Um, and despite this fact that, that, uh, the, that you have this, uh, all of these accidents uh, within nature, um, over the course of only a few dozen uh, generations, only a few hundred individuals within a species, this resolves itself into the well-describable law of, uh, of, of evolution, basically. The, 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 these, the species as a whole will adapt uh, in the direction of its greatest fitness within, within that ecosystem. So you see that necessity expresses itself through a multitude of accidents. And in fact, um, Trotsky even went on to say the following, uh, which I really like because I think it shows how accident expresses itself through uh, necessity also in human history. Uh, he said the following in my life. He said that, broadly speaking, the entire historical process is a refraction of the historical law through the accidental. In the language of biology, one might say that the historical law is realized through the natural selection of accidents. Excuse me. On this foundation, there develops that conscious human activity which subjects accidents to a process of artificial selection. So he, he saw that the, 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 this unity of, of accident and necessity actually amplifies and, and gives rise to the possibility of, of artificial selection, of the subjective factor intervening in the, the objective processes of social development, that the two are interdependent, if you like. Now, just coming back to this, uh, this question of uh, Newtonian, the Newtonian view of the world, of course, we know that it was, in many respects, uh, brought down. Um, a revolution overthrew it and, and put it in its rightful place. That was in quantum mechanics and relativity. But in fact, the first attacks upon the Newtonian view of the universe didn't come from that direction. They actually came from, uh, from the theory of heat in the 19th century, started to be used polemically, actually, against Laplace's demon, attacking this notion that everything is governed by this iron necessity. And you had a, a great uh, breakthrough by a guy called Ludwig Boltzmann in, uh, in 1870, who basically gave a new interpretation to an idea which had been empirically discovered. What we discovered is that if you have an engine, right, you, t you burn coal, uh, you turn it into heat, and that uh, is transmitted into motion. Uh, some of that energy, when it goes through its transformations, this energy is neither created nor destroyed, but a lot of it is lost as heat, right? Which is just disordered, chaotic motion. It's just molecular motion that is, that is uh, uncontrollable, and it dissipates into the universe. And uh, Boltzmann said that actually this reflects uh, the fact that systems as a whole tend towards the most probable outcome. An example, um, if you were a farmer and you had a field of sheep and you had a field of cows, uh, that's a very orderly system, right? You know, I mean, all the sheep and the cows are separated by a fence. If I open the gate to that fence, the sheep and the cows will start wandering around and eventually there will be half the sheep in one and half the sheep in the other and likewise with the cows, right? Until motion has ceased, you've reached an equilibrium, basically. Um, and that therefore, this was a, an interesting interpretation of this notion that, that, things, that, that heat tends to uh, increase, if you like, that you have a dissipation of energy within the universe, this second law of thermodynamics. Um, and what this seems to say, it, it, it was a revolution really, because what it said is you can, you can calculate how heat dissipates and so forth, but it takes place in a probabilistic manner through, through a, a lot of tiny accidents statistically you get the objective necessity of the laws of the, of the transformation of, of energy, the, law, the second law of thermodynamics, uh, emerge from this. Um, so for the first time, there was an attempt to unify accident and necessity within physics. And yet, um, yeah, so this was a big step forward. It, it introduced history into physics. You can boil an egg, but you can't unboil an egg. Um, if you leave a cup of coffee down on the table, it will go down to, uh, to room temperature. It won't suddenly spontaneously start rising in temperature. So, so suddenly, uh, you know, the universe had a history. It was not this time-reversible piece of clockwork mechanism that the Newtonian view had. And yet it, it itself is extremely one-sided. Because if you consider it, what it says is that there is dissipation. Uh, it says that things tend to, uh, to chaos and to disorder, if you like. And there is undoubtedly, there are phenomena like the... The, the cooling cup of tea or these animals that are allowed to roam up on this chaotic farm that we've set up in my imagination. Um, there, it undoubtedly has a certain field of applicability, 
Um, and yet what it says is things tend towards equilibrium. Motion actually tends to cease in these cases, basically. And this was taken to an extreme to say that actually if you think of the universe as a whole, motion is running down. So we have a clockwork universe where, this, where, the, where the, uh, the, the, the spring is, not being, is what being wound down, basically, until eventually we'll have a heat death. Everything will be the same temperature, everything will reach an equilibrium, and motion will cease. So this, whilst it was a step forward, we had the clockwork universe, and then we have a clockwork universe which is winding down to an eventual death and stasis. Again, an extremely undialectical view of the universe, and one which actually does not correspond to the, to the world around us in many respects. If you look at, look at the world around you, you'll see that things are winding up. You have not greater dispersion of, uh, uh, not just dissipation, that is one feature of the universe, but you also have uh, growing organization, growing complexity within the universe, within biology. You had originally the primordial soup, which was complete disorder, which eventually organized itself into single-celled organisms and then more and more and more complex organisms. And human history follows the same development, uh, not in a linear fashion, but you have this process of development from the, the less complex forms of organization to the more highly organized and more complex forms of, of human society and culture and so forth. So um, clearly it is a, a one-sided tendency, but it came about fundamentally, in my opinion, partly as a result of a natural process within science, because science itself has to break things down into their constituent parts. Uh, it has to look at things in their isolation. You have to understand, before you can understand, for example, uh, how air resistance works, you have to imagine, imagine we get all of the air out of the room and then we drop these two uh, objects and see how they fall. It isolates things, it forms closed systems, um, because uh, it is necessary to do so in order to understand these more simple things. But therefore, it's all the more necessary to have a philosophy to be able to put the universe back together. Because actually, things don't exist in closed, isolated systems. In a closed system, you can have a pendulum which very nicely goes back and forwards for all eternity. You can have a cup of tea reaching an equilibrium with its surroundings. And you can have cows and sheep frolicking on a farm or whatever you want. <laughs> Um, but the universe is not a closed system, it is an open system. As Richard Lewontin, Lewontin said, the great Marxist biologist, uh, a, a spleen or a pancreas or a stomach or an intestine, they only exist under the knife of the anatomist. In nature, you only have the whole organism and we have to understand things in their interactions, in their complexity and development as a whole. Uh, the problem is, actually, that is very complicated because by isolating these closed systems, you, you create a class of very easily solvable problems within physics. But, uh, you, for example, if I don't look at a farm, but I, I consider an open ecosystem, it is actually far more complex. Every part interacts with every other part. You have uh, not, not simple random motion of cows and sheep. You have... Uh, you, you have great migrations and herds, and these herds break up into smaller herds because they need to go and look for resources because uh, they're at threat of, uh, of overeating the vegetation. You have predation, you have overpredation, so that predators themselves be, uh, enter into a decline in their populations because they've eaten too many of the prey animal. So you have feedback loops within, within the world, uh, and you have extreme complexity, basically. Now that's very difficult to, to, to actually model, whereas it's very much easier to model these simpler um, ab abstract uh, ideas, these models that we create, that science often creates. And therefore, in order to be able to look at these open systems, more complex systems, such as the weather, for example, which itself is not, uh, is not simply, it doesn't reach uh, an equilibrium of stasis like the cup of tea reaching room temperature. Uh, it is constantly out of equilibrium. In fact, we see that non-equilibrium uh, non open systems uh, dynamic systems are the, the norm. Equilibrium is not the norm. It is, it is actually the, uh, uh, it is a very special uh, case, basically, within nature. Most things are far from e in equilibrium. And the weather is exactly one of those. Um, you see, uh, the, however, a big uh, step forward, really, I think, a, a tremendous revolution took place in the middle of the 20th century, which allowed us to begin exploring these things for the first time in mathematical detail. And that was, of course, the invention of the computer. Now, for the first time, we're able to actually model extremely complex systems or uh, uh, at least create uh, um, yeah, models that approximate to these systems. And uh, indeed, there was a guy called Edward Lorenz who, in the middle of the 20th century, began sitting down to a computer trying to predict the weather. And uh, he used a very simple uh, model. It only had 12 parameters. It clearly wasn't like the weather that we understand it. Um, but, you know, he modeled things like humidity, wind speed, uh, pressure, temperature, and so forth. 
and uh, he expected to be able to predict how this system would unfold for uh, an, an, an unlimited amount of time, basically. And what he found is he, he, he ran this model, and then he ran it again. And he found that it started off doing the same thing, and then it started to diverge, until eventually, after a period of time, it was completely unrecognizable. The system was completely different. And what he found is he put the figures that he put back into the system had a rounding error of 0 0.001 difference with the original parameters. It was a tiny difference, basically. And, uh, and yet, this had profound implications for science. What it actually said is that um, the, uh, uh, even though we may have these deterministic laws, uh, even though we may be able to understand all that there is to understand about the weather, yet you have this extreme sensitivity to starting conditions that out of these predictable laws can arise chaos, can arise unpredictability. Um, and this was led to the interpretation, as you may have heard, of the butterfly effect, the idea that a butterfly flapping its wings in Britain uh, can have such a tiny uh, difference here, but it could have the overall effect of causing a hurricane in the Caribbean, for example. Of course, that's a slight misinterpretation in many respects, so it's one-sided because it's not the butterfly that causes it, it's the interaction of all of the parts of the system that cause the, 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 the development of these patterns. So we actually lose a certain amount of predictability within these chaotic systems. And you can see that human society, in many respects, is more like the weather than it is like a swinging pendulum or a, a fields of cattle and sheep or whatever silly example I gave earlier. Um, it, is a, it is an extremely chaotic system with all sorts of interacting factors uh, uh, going on. And yet, whilst we lose a lot of the ability to predict the weather long term, we can say that there are well-defined features within the weather that are very well understood under what circumstances they arise. We have only a very limited number of pressure systems, storms, hurricanes, uh, cloud patterns and so forth. So on another level, we see that there are patterns that constantly repeat but never exactly repeat. That the weather uh, never repeats but it rhymes really. And likewise in human history, we can see that there are developments that we understand how these developments take place, but they never take place in exactly the same way. Uh, and in fact, uh, um, I don't really have time to go into the idea of uh, strange attractors within uh, chaos theory, and I don't really want to explain what they are. But uh, if, you if you plot these, uh, these um, parameters that Edward Lorenz was talking about, what you find is that the system forms these patterns, spiral patterns actually, never exactly repeating itself, but forming very similar patterns. And I'll compare that to the theory of dialectics of the negation of the negation, which this is how Alan describes it in Reason in Revolt. He says that dialectics envisages the fundamental process at processes at work in the universe and society and in his the history of ideas, not as a closed circle where the same processes merely repeat themselves as an, in an endless mechanical cycle, but as an open-ended uh, spiral of development in which nothing is ever repeated exactly in the same way before. Um, now, I don't, uh, I don't have a huge amount of, uh, of time left, so I'm going to uh, bring things to a close in, in, in a minute. But uh, first of all, I, that I want to look at another um, feature of these non-linear uh, dynamic systems, which is very well explained in a book that I highly recommend. There's a few books that I recommend, really. I highly recommend that comrades read Dialectics of Nature and anti During in particular. And on top of that, Reason in Revolt, which I've just quoted from, it's an excellent book. It looks at these... Uh, the, 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 how dialectics finds itself confirmed within nature. But uh, when you've read those, I highly recommend a, a fourth book, which is a, a book called Ubiquity by a guy called Mark Buchanan. And uh, what he showed is that, uh, what, what he explains in this book is that other scientists have showed that co these complex systems tend towards actually self-organization. And in particular, they tend to organize to a very special state, which is, is very rare in equilibrium physics. And that is called the critical state, the boundary, the turning point between one state and another, one phase and another. In, in equilibrium physics, you have to actually fine-tune things to get them to this precise boundary. Um, you have to get to a very specific temperature or, or pressure or what have you. Uh, if you want to go from the, the, find the state between magnetized and non-magnetized iron, for example, it's at about 700 and something uh, degrees centigrade. You have to fine-tune things to get them on that uh, a barrier in equilibrium physics, much like balancing a pencil on its lead. Uh, it's, it's very unstable. Uh, however, what he found is in, in non-equilibrium uh, physics, in, uh, in dynamic systems, things actually tend towards this critical state. They tend towards this fine tuning, this fine balancing, basically. Uh, and under those circumstances, in this critical state, 
you can see that tiny effects can have massive qualitative effects, basically, uh, uh, outcomes. Uh, tiny uh, inputs can have massive out outcomes. You can have, uh, for an example that he gives, is a, a, a pile of sand where you drop grains upon that sand until it becomes steeper and steeper. Uh, and what you find is it organizes into a critical state where the next grain of sand might have the effect of causing an avalanche of one or two sand grains, it might be a few hundred, or it might be a few million. And in fact, where it falls could collapse the east or the west side of the, uh, of the, of the, of the sand pile. Um, and it, uh, it, it's entirely down to accident how that takes place. So this, this organization of things into their critical state where tiny effects can have massive uh, changes on a system, qualitative changes on a system, uh, were discovered and uh, uh, examples were given in this book by uh, Buchanan of earthquakes, of stock market crashes, fluctuations in fashion, war, mass extinctions. So in other words, there is this, uh, this, this lawfulness to how change takes place in these non-equilibrium uh, non systems, which I don't have that much time to, to go into, unfortunately. But finally, to bring it back, I want to give an example from uh, our own experience, which is uh, of, of, of society. Why is this interesting? Why is this of interest to us as revolutionary Marxists who want to transform society? And why is it of interest to us um, as Marxists? Um, what does this actually tell us about society? Well, likewise, in nature, as, as in nature, within society, you find this critical state constantly re-emerging. And in fact, we had a debate within Britain uh, amongst Marxists, the supporters of socialist appeal, uh, in 2015-2016, after the election of Jeremy Corbyn. Now, what, what we had said for many years is we had said that uh, as the class struggle develops in, in, in Britain, the Labour Party will be transformed. And yet, in our articles in 2015-2016, we described Jeremy Corbyn as an accident, basically. He, it was something that might or might not have happened, basically. And some comrades said, how can a revolution, and you, we just called it the Corbyn Revolution in many of our, uh, uh, you know, in much of our literature, how can a revolution be caused by an accident? Um, it seems absurd. Um, and yet, precisely, it was an accident. After all, Corbyn could have been hit by a bus the day before, uh, <laughs> God, you know, God forbid. Um, Margaret Beckett uh, might have uh, had a, a sudden... Um, you know, sense might have suddenly come to her and she decided not actually to, to nominate Corbyn. Or, uh, you know, any of these sort of things might have happened. Corbyn might have decided uh, not to have breakfast in the morning and that made him a bit grumpy, so he didn't stand for uh, election of the leader of the Labour Party. Now, all, history is made up of all of these tiny accidents, many of them ridiculous, and yet they can have profound and far-reaching effects. And what I would say is actually, if you look at every single revolution in history, has been started, apparently, been started by an accident, in fact. Just uh, in 2010, you had the death of a young man called Mohamed Bouazizi in Tunisia. Uh, now, this young man's life, in many respects, was nothing, uh, was nothing special. There was nothing special about this particular young man. But he was so humiliated and, and, uh, uh, by the regime, he was, uh, his life was such a daily struggle simply to survive uh, that he killed himself. He immolated himself and uh, uh, that particular suicide, which, was probably, which is definitely not the, uh, the first and certainly won't be the last suicide in, 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 in Tunisia by a, a young man who's reached the, the end of desperation, um, had a massive effect. It, uh, it, it basically resonated with millions of people who saw in that young man their own conditions and went out onto the streets and brought down a dictator. And eventually, of course, it didn't just have that effect in Tunisia, it had an effect in Egypt and the, and the wider Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and yet, this, what this man did was, in many respects, an accident. He might have, or he might not have, uh, 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 done so. And likewise in the Lebanon. Who can, who can say that the insurrectionary movement that we've seen in the Lebanon in recent days has anything to do with WhatsApp or charging for WhatsApp calls? It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with the build-up of, of anger within society until the point where it reached that, that tipping point, basically, where an accident can have a massive effect and uh, another example which I think uh, illustrates this uh, much better in many ways because it shows what, a, what an imprint, an accident can have on history is the example of Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. Because after all, if Hugo Chavez, who was, a, uh, you know, he was an officer in the Venezuelan army, had died fighting guerrillas in the jungles of Venezuela, of course he would not have been able to play the role that he did in the Venezuelan revolution in 1998 onwards. 
Um, and of, so in many respects, he was himself an accident of history. Yet who can doubt the huge impact that this accident had, a decisive impact. Venezuelan history will never, Venezuela will never be the same again. It has laid down a tradition amongst the workers and the poor, uh, the Bolivarian tradition, which was a creation of, of Hugo Chavez. Um, and so it had a huge impact, a decisive impact. And yet, of course, if he had not come along, or if Mohamed Bouzizi had not, uh, had not killed himself in that way, um, or if, if, if Jeremy Corbyn had decided not to stand for the Labour Party, there would have still been these revolutionary movements, but they would have expressed themselves very differently, decisively differently, possibly. Uh, in Britain, for example, if, if, uh, if, if uh, Corbyn had not stood for election back in, uh, in 2015, as I think was entirely possible that he, he might have decided not to, Many of the lefts also had a completely pessimistic view. They didn't think they were going to win this. He stood because it was his turn. John McDonnell had stood twice, and he stood because it was, uh, it, was, it, you know, it, was, it was his turn, basically. There were lefts who thought that they shouldn't stand. They would get humiliated. They would get thrashed. I don't know, and I'm not saying that that was the position of Jeremy Corbyn. But if he hadn't have stood, what would have been the outcome from the point of view of the development of the Labour Party? I don't think it's beyond the realms of possibility to say that you could have seen the near destruction of that party. Under a right-wing leadership, uh, you know, a, a Blairite or whoever else, an Andy Burnham or a Liz Kendall of this world have been at the leadership, the Labour Party in England and Wales could have gone the same way that it went in Scotland. So you see that things were, in many respects, on a knife edge. And an accident falling one of two sides could have completely different uh, transformative effects. And indeed, of course, something would have, that anger would have still been there had Corbyn not been elected, if the Labour Party had even been more or less destroyed. But it would have found another expression, a very different expression. So you see that one small accident can, ha can have a, a, a decisive effect. And in many respects, I've said, as I, I think like Trotsky's analogy is a very beautiful one, the idea that history is the natural selection of a, of a whole host of accidents. Because in many respects, I, I would go further than saying that simply that... Um, Revolutions are caused by accidents. I would go so far as to say that the whole of history is, is in many ways nothing but this, a whole host of accidents, some of which have a bigger and a smaller effect. Um, think of economics, for example. What is economics? What is the market economy? If, if it's not whether I decide to buy a cheese sandwich uh, at lunch at Tesco or if I decide to go and get a, a pastry at the wonderful stall over there or whether I decide to take out a mortgage, which I obviously can't afford. There is a strong necessity uh, uh, pushing me against that. Or I decide until the, 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 the housing market crashes and get a, you know, decide to get a mortgage a few years later. Whether an investor buys or an investor sells, is, there's a whole host of accidents. And yet, out of that myriad of accidents emerges the law of, 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 of capitalist development, which has very well-definable features. The law of the boom and bust of the ten, more or less 10-year cycle of, uh, of capitalist economics, the longer term trends, the secular stagnation that we're seeing setting in. Um, and we can see that in many respects, history is composed of a whole infinite host of accidents, like those sand grains falling upon that sand pile that I talked about a minute ago. Um, uh, whether, you know, whether I decide, whether um, I, I sleep in in the morning or whether uh, Jeremy Corbyn stands for election or whether a young man kills himself in Tunisia, there is this whole host of accidents that eventually form, if you like, much like the falling sand grains form a dune, they form a landscape uh, which determines where the future accidents may fall, but not necessarily where they will fall. So I think by understanding these processes, by studying them in nature, and also studying them in, in society, looking at the history of revolutions, and seeing that uh, a, a small effect can have a huge qualitative transformation upon a system, we can understand how we can best use our forces. We are going through a process of artificial selection ourselves. We are artificially selecting the most advanced workers and youth and bringing them together in a revolutionary organization to overthrow capitalism. So that when the, the moment comes, we can decisively throw our small forces onto the scales of history and tip it in a way that will transform the whole of human history decisively um, uh, uh, with the socialist transformation of society. Thank you.